I think the bottom line is even I look at myself, I don't pay for FSD. We don't have FSD subscription up in Canada either. I'm not paying, I think it's $19,500 now Canadian to subscribe for FSD. So I don't have it. But if Tesla came out with something for a hundred bucks per month and it packaged up a bunch of cool features that I do want to try, like personally, mm-hmm. I've never tried Smart Summon. That would be something pretty cool to get out of my parking stall. If they packaged up auto lane change, which I hear people bragging about all the time, I would pay for that. And so I think what you're hinting on there is there's so much unmet demand that exists. It is tough because it's not like they're explicitly saying this either, right? Like you're having to deduce this and read between the lines. If they were to come out and say, look, we have a software advantage because we don't need RoboTaxi. If we launch something for a hundred bucks per month, you don't think we could get 20% of, of our current fleet to subscribe to this thing? If we just launched the software package with an app store, but they only give you the app store if you subscribe monthly, right? Maybe Tesla does it where it's like, look, we're only giving you the app store if you subscribe to this package because this package gives you internet, it gives you supercharging credits, it gives you this, and it gives you the ability to install apps on your car. Like I was talking about, why isn't there not a a YouTube streaming function out of my cabin Mm -hmm. camera that I can stream in the car when it's parked? You know, little stuff like that that I think... Mm -hmm. This is software, right? I love the business of software because the marginal costs are not very high. And I agree, there's a lot Tesla can do. We are going out on a limb on saying this because it's not like we've heard Zach or, or Elon or Drew or anyone talk about this sort of stuff other than just saying the black box word of software. But it totally makes sense. Awesome. Well, thank you for being with me today, Yashu. Uh, For those who don't know Yashu, he is an incredible resource. Uh, He deep dives Tesla stock. Tesla the company, uh, very, very knowledgeable about options. And most of his content on hit that bid is uh, really focused on options specifically, but also deeply understands macro. And um, I would say that combination of things is pretty unique in the Tesla space. And you are an incredible resource. So anyone who as not a subscriber of Yashu's, I would highly recommend you check him out on YouTube at Hit That Bid. Yeah, so Yashu, let's see. I kind of want this to be a free flowing conversation today. And I really, um, one of the goals on my interviews is just to get to know you a little bit better as a person. And then we'll try and explore the way that you think throughout the interview and hopefully come away from all of that with some takeaways for the audience on just how to think critically about topics and potentially just improve the way that they can uh, process information that is coming at them from a hundred different angles these days. So Mm -hmm. yeah, with that, um, I know that you don't like talking about yourself a whole lot, but I did want to start with a question. So what are some, like, if you think back to your childhood years, what are some of the highlights and what are some of the things that maybe were low lights that um, just provide a little bit of relief that uh, might give us a little bit of insight into how did Yashu grow up to be the Yashu that we see today? How did I grow up to be this menace? Well, thanks for having me on, Hans. Um, You know, it's interesting. It's like, you know, you talk about the channel and you talk about macro and Tesla and options. It's funny because it's like all of this wasn't planned and just kind of happened and kind of took off organically. And I think that's the best way that it could possibly happen. So um, I'm very happy to see that you started posting on your channel a lot more now. And I I suggest everyone hit subscribe and leave him a comment down below to to continue to push Hans forward. Um, Mm -hmm. My my. I'll keep it real brief, but you know, I'm a, I'm a big sports guy, right? I've, I've always played sports growing up basketball, particularly. Uh, so I've always been a part of a team, a uh, part of, part of a, a group, I don't want to say group think, right. But a, a part of a, a, a part of a, a situation at most of my life where I haven't had to be awesome at everything. I could kind of, you know, have bite-sized knowledge points on something and then it could be supplemented by people around me because they're really good at something that I'm really bad at. So I think growing up, one big part of what just general learning for me has been is that I don't need to be, I don't need to know everything, but I do need to be around people that can supplement what I'm weak at. Um, and so growing up, my dad, uh, and I've, I've shared this story a ton. My dad was a, is a big stock guy, right? He loves talking about companies, revenue, profit, um, mostly stock price and options trading. So 
growing up, like, you know, one of my first memories, you know, at, I think it was four, I was four or five years old, like preschool or kindergarten, I forget, is my dad buying stocks uh, on his RBC website uh, on our big old PC back in the day. And him being like, oh, like we should buy you some stock. And like, what do you want to buy stock in? And I was like, how, like the only thing I knew how to spell it, like three or four was like kids. So I was like, throw in kids. Like, let, let's see if a stock comes up. And, 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 and sure enough, it did. I didn't even know what the stock was to this day. I don't even know if he actually bought it or if he was just, you know, playing around with me because I couldn't actually read at that, at that point. But I've always been around talking about stocks and financial stuff and, and for better or for worse trading. Cause my dad's always been uh, an options trader. Um, self admittedly, he's kind of been, st- he's, he's, he's always, it's funny. Cause he goes through like, you know, a year and a half of like every day is trading. And then he's like, yeah, I'm done. I'm done. I can't do this anymore. It's high stress. I'm never doing it ever again. I talked to him two months later, he's making trades again. Right? Like he, he it just at the heart of hearts of my dad is just, and God bless him. He just loves talking about and, and, and trading options uh, for better or for worse and <laughs> recently for worse. And so being around that, I've just been very, it's almost like I, I've taken a level of risk uh, averseness from that because, you know, I kind of see the losses. I, I see like, trades going bad. And I've had my fair share, even growing up in high school, my dad gave me a trading account to manage his trading account. And I was managing it. And I blew up the account. Um, And it's like, I go, I've gone through so much of that in my early, in my early years, where it's like, I've put in kind of mental, almost hurdles um, in place for me now, you know, like, if, 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 if you make three winning trades in a row, and the fourth one is a losing one, everyone wants to focus on how you lost on the fourth one. But you have to look at the whole entire thing as a net. What have you done plus or minus throughout the entire time? And so certain things like that, putting in money into the stock market that you don't, that you want to lock away and you don't need tomorrow, right? That's a big one. People putting away money from their checking being like, oh, I just need, I just, I'm just going to make a quick trade here. And, you know, as soon as this trade goes my way, like every trade will, right? Everyone in history thinks this way. <laughs> I'm going to pull it out and I'll have enough money for my checking and savings, whatever I need for, for next month's rent. So certain things like that early on, I've divided out mentally in my head. You know, I, when I put something in my brokerage account, trust me, it's going to be gone, but not because it's going to be gone because it's coming back. It's going to be gone because I probably blew it up, but it's going to be there and mentally there. At least when I trade with it, it's something that I don't have to think about of, Oh, this was this many, uh, you know, backpacks I could have bought or this many out dinners I could like I don't do the mental kind of like and which everyone does originally Mm -hmm. like man I could have bought a car for what I just lost on this right so that sort of stuff early on I've been triggered and scarred by so for better or for worse there's that in terms of weaknesses right and trust me there's a lot so I can keep going but in terms of highlights I looking back now it's like when I talk about macro stuff when I talk about Tesla stock when I talk about financials I, and I talk about it on stream. I'm just, I realize how blessed I am that, you know, growing up, uh, this is kind of the lingo that we shared when we were just talking, uh, you know, at home. And it was something that we were talk about the news and we were talk about how stocks reacted after earnings and my dad buying these puts and they all went to waste. And, you know, so I just realized that uh, looking back and oftentimes it's only when we look back uh, multiple years back and we see how blessed we are mm-hmm. that, you know, that sort of stuff, it, I guess, really came in handy and really, you know, developed my interests um, in, in even talking about stocks. Um, because, I mean, at the end of the day, what are stocks? There's just businesses. And at the end of the day, I love talking business. Stocks just happen to be public. That's the only caveat. And of course, all everything um, is not a black box, like a private business. Everything is public on the public record for people to invest in. And so, at the at the heart of hearts, at the core of core, I I, I think I just love talking business re- revenue generation. I love talking in tactics on how to you know increase revenue, how to have lower costs, how can we extract more out of this business, how can we grow these sort of conversations. I just love talking about. Uh, I didn't really get into Tesla. I got into Tesla late, um, uh, and and I had so much reserve. I had, I had a lot of reservations even, uh, and I tell this story a lot. Uh, you know, my dad took me for a test drive. Because he wanted a Tesla, mm-hmm. I was like, Dad, like, what are you doing? Why are you buying a Tesla? You know, do you not know about this about EVs that? And he's like, yeah, don't worry, you know. And trust me, he's been showing me Kathy uh, Kathy Wood um, videos on CNBC for years, uh, and pretty much everything changed when 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 uh, as soon as we test drove this thing. 
and I wasn't a staunch bear or anything. It was just that I kind of bought the fight. I kind of read the headlines and I didn't really care too much about dive, deep diving into it. So it was just kind of, for me, it was like, yeah, I guess this is kind of the way that I feel about Tesla, but it wasn't like, oh, I'm a, you know, I've read all of this and I wasn't really astutely aware, but test driving, of course, sitting in the passenger seat was one thing, but towards the end, my dad was like, yeah, now, you know, uh, now it's your turn. And there was no one with us. Like they just let you kind of go test drive yourself. And it was, it was all of us, uh, my sister as well. And my mom, and we were about to head home. My dad's like, no, we're not heading home until you also test drive this car. And so I reluctantly, I got into the driver's uh, seat and pretty much the first couple of blocks after driving this thing, I was like, okay, this feels different. This is like the iPhone moment for me. There's something here that the product is speaking to me that I was so wrong about. I realized at that moment that I was like, man, how was I so wrong? I'm such an idiot. And then I realized, okay, I got to start deep diving into this a little bit more. But that's how I kind of got into the space and um, kind of a little bit of background of, of just of me. Yeah, that, I would say on getting into Tesla, mine is somewhat similar. I don't think I invested until 2017 or 2018. And it was somewhat, you know, knowing like the product. Um, but also it was my experience having been very anti uh, Apple and you know all mm. the Apple fanboys growing up in college <laughs> used to annoy the mess out of me. I was like, "This is the dumbest group of cult <laughs> followers I've ever seen." And then you know, watching Apple then release the iPhone, um, building off of the iPod and their continued success, and then eventually coming to use the products and love the products, and now like. I'm talking to you on a MacBook Air. I've got iPhone, iPad, like I'm all in the ecosystem. And I have a hard, like I don't like using <clears throat> Android products. I don't even like using Windows products anymore. It's just like, this is what I know and I understand and I love. And yeah. going through that transition helped me to recognize, I was like, oh, here are these like crazy cult people again. <laughs> and they're all, all in tesla and maybe instead of resisting that as my first impulse this time maybe i should be curious and investigate instead and mm -hmm. uh, that kind of began the the research journey which led to small investments which led to larger investments and here we are beautiful so yeah um so when you say you love talking investments you love talking business what are some of the formative like mental frameworks that you use for business? Are there any books or philosophies? Like what are some of the big influences other than just conversations with your dad that help you to think about business in a systematic way? Yeah, there's, uh, there's a ton. I think a big book for me that really shaped my thinking, uh, especially early on, uh, is called The Millionaire Fastlane by MJ DeMarco. I, I, I read that book often, um, probably at least once a year on audiobook. I have it. I have a paper copy as well. And the reason why, so the, 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 I will say first here, like the book title sucks. The book cover sucks. Even he admits to this, but the book itself is all about frameworks of business and the, the, just the math of, um, you know, if, if you're trying to reach financial freedom, what is the best mathematical equation to get you there. And long story short, and there's a lot in it, so I'm not going to ruin it, but I highly recommend everyone pick it up and, 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 and take a glance is business is the way because business is not only is business scalable, business is sellable. So if you build a business, you can sell that business. Um, you can hire people in that, but it's, it's, there's so much more to it, but reading that book really shaped my thinking around, you know, at the end of the day, how do businesses work and why are they the almost the sole road to success often? Like you don't really hear about a billionaire trader, right? Yes, investor. And I guess as an investor, you are somewhat of a business owner, but you're not operating that business. So business of this vehicle, real like this 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 vehicle called business, um, really was like, okay, this is it. Like if I study this, if I spend however much long in, in my adulthood, getting to know every bit piece of the small businesses, large businesses, medium-sized businesses, how do they attract customers? How do they market to customers? 
what's their flow look like? What's their sales cycle look like? What's their marketing um, uh, automation look like? And specifically around revenue, because I think almost every, like, I think 80%, uh, 80% of small businesses fail within the first year. I think it's actually more than that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, the rest of them fail within years two to five. So it, it's, it's just so hard as a small business owner to get your business off the ground. And then there's different stages of evolution of growth as well past there. But for, for me, it was just that book in particular really summed it down to me in terms of a mathematical equation of, you know, if you were to work on anything, right? Some people work on, let's say, getting that next college degree for that master's, that PhD. Uh, you're essentially trying to say, okay, I want a 10% raise at work, 20% raise at work, whatever it might be. If you can, if, and, and, and let's say alternatively, you spend all your time building this asset right? This, it, this wholly owned subsidiary that exists with or without you as a living organism that operates, let's say, that is one day sellable. You're not sellable. You like, I can't sell the fact that I have a, let's say a master's or a PhD, which I don't, but let, I can't sell that off to someone. But if I build a, a, an entity that essentially prints cash, that is something that can. So just business in general, and that book, um, you know, Think and Grow Rich is, is another foundational mm-hmm. big one. Um, but so many books, but I, I think what for me, especially living in the YouTube revolution growing up, um, YouTube has been a a large source of where I've acquired a lot of my skills, to be honest, people that share their skill sets, share their marketing skill sets, Mm -hmm. share their sales skill sets, applying that knowledge, learning that from YouTube is just invaluable. And I think so many people, you know, even in adulthood, continue to learn on YouTube. First, it's kind of like mini audiobooks. Um, and and they get to jump around from place to place. So we kind of get that ADD fix a little bit. But we also get to get different varieties of opinions from people like this person might be too too aggressive for me with all my sales tactics, uh, tactics. But maybe I do want a piece of that in me, but I don't want the entire thing. Maybe this person is too methodical and formal for me. But you know what? I needed sometimes I I do need to rein it in. So it, it's it's mm-hmm. it's a conglomeration of everything, but it's always tied back to trying to get better and trying to master whatever I'm trying to do, um, which I know is is um, <laughs> is not possible. It's ascent, you know, uh, um, it, it's just not possible to ever get 100 percent there. Uh, but you always work towards that, I guess. Well, let me ask you a boring question first, and then a more interesting question. Who like on YouTube, are there any creators that you would recommend specifically that you have learned just a ton from have been incredibly influential? And then the more interesting question is, how do you select who it is that you're going to give that attention to and Mm. hone in on who those people end up being for you? Mm, That's a good one. Um, I guess honestly, it would really depend on the topic. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I would be just lying if I threw out a couple pieces of people be, or a cu- couple of channels, just because, like, I would, ha- I would have to know, like, okay, marketing, it's, it's probably this person. Like, Solutions Eight is really mm-hmm. good in terms of specific Google Ads training. Uh, you know, this person is really good at higher level business stuff. Um, so it, it would just be very nuanced in that answer. But I think what's more important is how. Uh, first. I don't know why, but, you know, I tend to think that I'm a pretty good judge of character, um, or at least I try to be. I've tried to develop, like, my gut over time, uh, even to a fault. Like, you know, even growing up, I would always say, like, I'd rather trust my gut, be wrong, because in five or ten years' time, that gut will get better with it, with with age. And so... You know, I would say gut is 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 a is one, but it's not really scalable for anyone listening. Um, but I would say listen to people who are happy to be wrong. Uh, that's a big one, right? If I listen to someone <laughs> and everything that they say they think is amazing, and they've never been wrong in their life, and they cut piecemeal whatever they want to say to me um, with only showing good results, um, and they only talk about. And, and they only hate on other people. Let's say that's another big red flag for me is they've built their channel. Uh, I, I know some people in specifically the business space that have that have amazing fan bases, let's say today in terms of size, but they've built them on backs of just essentially running hit pieces on, on bigger people trying to get attention and then build up their following base. I guess that's a strategy that you can go after, right? Um, and there's a difference between like, uh, just hate and, and, and like critique, right? I, I think it's it's very mm-hmm. nuanced, of course, but hate and critique are very different. It's okay to critique. It, it hate is a different is a different monster. Um, but 
people I try to I try to gravitate towards those type of positive, influential people that sound like they know what they're talking about, but also are happy to show where they're wrong all, um, often. Yeah, I would I would 100 percent agree with that. And I think um, the one thing that I guess does give me a little bit of solace is that the people who try to grow that way, eventually they get kind of trapped into that and there's definitely a ceiling. And so it's like an easy short term gains strategy, but it's not the thing that's going to uh, get the biggest over the long term. Like, you know, Mr. Beast is not going to engage in that kind of strategy. Right. And like yeah. his strategy is a much better strategy long term that can take you a lot farther if you're willing to be patient and allow the compounding to just naturally take its course. Absolutely. So. For sure. Yeah. It, it's always about the long game and and it should be. And and often like the best creators are the ones that are thinking long term. So it kind of works hand in hand that way as well, where you know if someone wants to stick around for the long term and be able to give advice 10 years down the line to me, uh, he's probably or he or she's probably not going to be doing that sort of stuff um, for 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 as you said, more of the short term views. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I always like to look for people, like you said, that not only will they be real and authentic with me, but also people who will share stuff um, without always needing something in return, basically generosity in their approach to creation. Mm -hmm. I feel like I trust people a lot more who will do that, uh, you know, rather than if it's behind a paywall, like you have got to really earn my trust way before I'm ever going to like, you've got to give me quite a bit to, to get me to cross over that threshold. Um, whereas people who are much more liberal with being able to share value with people and operate from more of an abundance strategy than that zero sum strategy, uh, I think are people that I, I naturally tend to trust more and be more interested in, their yeah. learnings overall. Absolutely. For sure. So how did you originally, going back to business, how did you get into ads and how does that tie into just your love of business and, and what you do overall? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, if, so anyone that follows me on Twitter or hears me talk about the channel, I talk about marketing and ads a lot and specifically about Tesla um, trying to test it or, or I guess not doing that yet. Um, how did I get into ads and marketing? Well, my love of business really, if you know, I don't love the logistics side of business as much. I don't love the operation side. I'm not an operator, but I love the revenue generation and the sales portion of it. So when I graduated university, I, I, I started working into software consulting tech sales. That's where I kind of got my start. Um, and essentially, um, I, I love sales. I've always been into sales because it's about the psychology of it. It's about how can I provide enough value, as you say, to someone for them to feel like, yes, you know, this person's get, earned me their trust and then me fulfilling on that and, and you know, having a happy customer. And what I've realized is business, if, if you were really to synthesize business down, it's about getting money from someone for something. Forget about the website, forget about the logo, forget about the ads for, for a second. It's just getting money from someone for something, Right. Uh, an, an equal or more uh, value proposition type of uh, equation there. And so sales was the natural path for me. I've always, I actually grew up doing door to door sales as well, um, which is a whole nother story. And so I would be out on the weekends by myself. They'd basically just chuck me in some random suburb of, of, of Vancouver and be like, this is your map, go sell. And so I'd have to go sell window washing or aeration services. So I did that in high school as well. Uh, it was definitely character building, I guess. Um, but now, for, for, as soon as I graduated, uh, graduated university, I was like, well, obviously, like for me, my end goal is always to like, okay, I, I want to start a business. I want to run a business. Um, and so I was like, okay, let's work in sales though. I need a job. I have student debt. Uh, I, got a, I got a software sales job. And I learned a lot. I actually worked for um, Aaron Ross, who's quite big in the software sales uh, niche. He, he was the VP of sales at Salesforce when they were about a $10 million company. He grew them to about $100 million in uh, ARR before he left and started. He started kind of the software sales methodology where it used to be the where where it used to be one sales guy 
prospecting on their own, trying to get meetings booked on his or her, her, her calendar, and then closing that lead. He divided them out into SDR, sales development reps, and account executives, AEs. One would do the prospecting and the booking of the calls. The other one would actually do the closing of the calls. Separating that out allowed for division of responsibility. And just, it's kind of like the, the kind of, uh, kind of like the Ford manufacturing line almost. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he kind of invented yeah, this. He wrote this book called building more of like a systematic sales funnel, right? Like, yeah. Systemized. Instead of one person. Yeah. Taking you all the way down the funnel. You've yeah. got different people at different levels and yeah. And really specializing. Yeah. And specialization is big, uh, but I guess people probably did it because they thought, oh, well, you know, you don't want to be switching around salespeople. Like, we, you know, we work hard to build that rapport up. But this allowed a lot of software companies in between, let's say, 2010 to 2020, really, this was foundational during that time uh, of growth. Uh, to really start to scale and, and really start to hire properly and put in uh, put in jobs that actually could could fit one piece of, uh, of of responsibility and you could crush it in there and the next person can crush it into their role and so um, then I kind of shifted into real estate marketing uh, and a real estate marketing firm I worked in sales as well but now on the closing side um, and. I just loved talking about, I just love closing the deal, right? Getting revenue for the company, making sure that uh, the customer is happy, but also just seeing like the company is growing because of your direct efforts, right? It was something about that that I've always loved. But working there and doing side hustles throughout high school as well, online businesses and and little, uh, little side stuff all the time. And we, we can talk about that later. Um, I'd always, I, I had been running ads um, myself out of my own pocket for testing, like trying to try, trying to run ads for this, trying to run ads on Amazon. And so I had experience running ads. And then when I worked at this real estate marketing firm, that's all they did, right? Spend hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, each and every month on paid advertising. So I got to see the back end of, okay, how are big agencies running ads uh, for, in this case, real estate? Um, and then with that experience, I started working actually with clients um, uh, myself on the side, whether it's accounting, uh, whether it's e-commerce, whether it's local businesses to run ads for them, let's say on Google, mostly on Facebook as well. And and I just loved, I, I love the idea of turning on something for a business owner and them getting revenue within the following couple of months. Like it's just, it, the, the bottom line impact is just, is, is unbeatable. So I've been lucky enough to see a lot of inside uh, baseball about big ad spends, how ad budget is spent. And not, we're not talking, by the way, TV ads. We're not talking, mm -hmm. you know, a media buys of, of you know, this big commercial that's going to go on Netflix or something. You know, these are granular, uh, gr more granular and, you know, let's say Google search specific, Google, U uh, uh, Google network, YouTube specific, Facebook uh, specific meta, I guess. Now it's digital advertising with paid um, with with a direct return on investment with TV ads. You don't really have a direct return on investment, obviously, uh, that's attributable. But we're talking in this case more of a attributable um, return on investment or ROAS, uh, so to speak. So that's how I got into it, I guess. Cool. So with that background, you know, we're at an interesting point now with uh, a lot of the Tesla community is really interested in Tesla devoting more energy to advertising right at this moment specifically. Um, what's your take on that situation? And we'll just say if you could wave a magic wand and Tesla would do or the Tesla community, whichever you'd like to prefer, if Tesla or the Tesla community could do one thing in the realm of advertising right now, what would it be? And more importantly, why, like, what are the mechanics? Why would you pick that thing? And what are you hoping the outcomes would be from that? Um, what's the insight that you would hope to glean? And what do you think the impact to the mission would be long-term? Hmm. Great question. Um, first, I, I do want to give kudos to Tesla's team because even though they're not advertising per se, they've given rides uh, uh, for, uh, for the Model S Plaid to YouTubers to do reviews on. They're posting more on Twitter. Um, they're posting more engaging content. They're replying to people. So they're doing stuff that's free and organic and great. And that, that's part of Tesla's brand as well is to be kind of boots on the ground. Advertising, specifically, if you have any reservations about it listening to this, remember the whole the sole purpose of advertising and marketing 
is to increase the broader awareness of what you're doing. The average person that I talk to that even has an EV does not know about Tesla supercharging network, doesn't know about how it works. They've seen it once or twice. They don't know how many superchargers there are. They don't really know about Tesla's battery advantage. They don't know about Tesla's software advantage. And you know why? Because they don't care. And what advertising does, what marketing does is it flicks on something in someone's head for them to to care, right? It's like, hmm, wait, I never actually thought about that. Let me let me actually go into that. And let me actually try to deep dive and find answers. Advertising and marketing isn't necessarily for um, the person that already knows everything or feels like they know everything uh, about Tesla already. And so in terms of what I would specifically do, I'm going to go counter to everything I just said for a hot second. I think the highest leverage of what Tesla could do in terms of direct paid media today would be quite simple. It would be running retargeting ads. So imagine you go on Tesla's website, you try to check out for their car, you're looking at pricing, you're kind of sure, but you're on the fence about, about it right now. And you abandon cart, right? You, you, you kind of sign up or you're like, yeah, you know what? Hmm, I'm just going to, I'm going to run the numbers again and, and see how it works. Run retargeting ads solely for people that have abandoned carts or checkouts for Tesla and run retargeting, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's on Google search, uh, whether, uh, you know, whether it's on Twitter, I guess, uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Meta and run retargeting. Cause those are very low cost. We're talking, uh, you know, retargeting, retargeting is like the Holy grail of, of, online paid media, especially if you've never run paid media before, just start with retargeting. It's essentially just a money printer. Mm -hmm. um, start with that because Tesla will have a lot of people that have abandoned checkout that, you know what, decided, okay, I'll, it's not pause for now. Remind them again of why you decided on a Tesla in the first place that you went on the website to try to check out. Remind them of, of, of the safety advantage. Remind them of that special promo of the price reduction that Tesla has just had. Uh, show them why Tesla should be top of mind for them once they do re-engage um, their interest to buy a car. So I think that would be the first easy step for Tesla to do. Yeah, I 100% I agree with that. And I think, so Emmett Peppers, Alexandra, a few people recently have made some really good points on anyone who's in the Tesla bubble right now. We understand that Tesla has just a completely different margin structure than any other player in the EV space currently. And there is a lot to be said that, you know, if we want to advance the adoption of sustainable energy technology, according to the mission, there's a lot of education that needs to be done in the broader populace, people that don't understand, don't know, like you said, these are not people who are in any way interested in Tesla. And this is really beyond the scope of going back to your previous point, this isn't really trying to let's get some high leverage, high return on ad spend marketing out there that instantly converts into sales. This is more, let's create a brand awareness and educate the public on the story behind sustainability, the story behind EVs. And, you know, Tesla has done a great job at telling that story but it's only reaching people right now who care. And so you need to figure out how to not just tell that story, but to get that story in front of people who wouldn't see it otherwise. And, you know, if we are trying not to make other companies who are making good faith efforts to build EVs that will help, you know, if, if Tesla's planning to make 20 million EVs in 2030, and they say that the global auto market at that time was still going to be around 80 million units, um, then that's a lot of EVs that have to come from somewhere if we want all the cars in 2030 to be yeah. EVs. And that, you know, yeah. this is a, something that most people rightly think that you know it's pretty ambitious to think that there's going to be three times the production of Tesla coming from other sources um, yeah. obviously BYD is a good company making decent products. They've, they've got a chance to make quite a few, but I don't think BYD is going to be making 60 million units on their own. Um, and they're the only ones really doing any sort of significant volume. And so if Tesla has, because they have been so smart strategically in their approach to building EVs and creating the economic forcing function towards EVs, they have the margin structure. Should it 
be the financial responsibility of Tesla also to take on that larger education marketing campaign that will then be something that helps other companies besides Tesla also to sell sustainable energy products, whether those be EVs or energy products. Um, Mm -hmm. What's your thought process in that? Yeah. Well, Tesla, I think if you're if you were to ask Elon, he would say, "Why not put this money into R and D? Why not put it into this?" And mm-hmm. and and I get it. Um, my <laughs> the big reason I think personally that Tesla, and specifically, I guess Elon does not do not want to at this point in time run ads is because you've built a five hundred billion dollar company without a dollar in marketing costs. Mm-hmm. Like it's just yeah. it's just nuts, right? So why stop? Like why start now? Right? Like what we're doing is incredible. Like, to be fair, if, if I ever did that, I would be, I would be like, my heels would be so far in the sand on this. I'd be like, are you kidding me? I've, I've built a trill. Well, I guess at one point, a trillion dollar company without $1 in marketing costs. Why would, why the hell would I start now? Just because we have a couple of price drops that brought price back down. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a degree of like, not trying to stain that record. And I get it. I think I'd probably be the same way. Um, like you said, I think education is so important because we people that say it's not assume that other people care. That's the big thing. No one cares. We live in a bubble. We care. Okay. I was talking to someone um, last week or two weeks ago now, and she drives an Audi e-tron. Okay. She bought that thing a year ago and I'm talking to her about her car and she knows nothing about Tesla for the most part. Right. She doesn't know about the software. She doesn't know about the supercharging. She's like, oh, half out. It's like, and it's like, okay, this is your quintessential EV buyer, right? You'd, you'd imagine that they'd done their EV research. Guess, guess what? No. Right. Oh, you know, when she heard about the range that the Model Y gets versus her e-tron, she was like, wait, what? How is that possible? So it's, it's, you know, it's degrees of, People that say it's not needed are living sort of in a bubble about this. Mm -hmm. And like you said, in 2030, if they want to hit 20 million cars, I'd I'd rather have some tailwind than headwind. And the the, the easiest way to have tailwind, a, a massive gust of tailwind come 2030 is to start just you know, slowly, you don't have to spend billions mm-hmm. of dollars, uh, you know, like your competitors do on, on advertising, but even strategically $50 million every year, let's say, and just start blowing that gust of wind a little bit. So come 2030, those compound effects have already kicked in and you could perceivably sell those 20 million vehicles at a higher price point because of demand than you otherwise could. So I can see both sides of this. I am obviously biased because I, like to run paid media, I run paid media and, and it's part of what I do. So I can see how I, I would be a little bit uh, uh, blind about the other side. But I do see the, well, we have a track record of not spending a dollar on, on paid media. Let's just do organic everything. Mm-hmm. So I kind of see both sides of it. Yeah, I think that that is probably, I honestly believe that Tesla could sell 20 million units without doing any advertising or taking on that education burden that it really is kind of a butts and seats thing that as long as you scale production up high enough, you follow rights curve, you get your production cost low enough, you can produce the car, especially then if you have the ability to operate SaaS products that bring in additional margins on your hardware, that all of that allows you to probably get there. But is that mm-hmm. the best thing for the mission is the question. And I think that there's a difference between what's best for Tesla, the company, and what's best for the mission of Tesla. And that's where I feel like people like Emmett have a really good argument that says, you know, you're taking on that burden of educating the public on why these products are not only needed, but actually why they're economically, they make sense, why technologically yeah. they make sense, like why these are just the best products in the market is yeah. a really good thing. And if you can eliminate some of the need for other companies to spend on advertising because the general awareness is there and That's the true. demand <laughs> is there, then then those other companies who are struggling in you know financially to to make those products, well, at least there's a little bit less strain on them. 
Um, and so, yeah, yeah, I think that's that's a really good perspective to take into account if if the mission of Tesla is what you care about and not the stock price in 2030 as like I think if you if you're a real long term investor and you believe in the larger things like FSD like Robo Taxi Tesla bot. Yeah. Tesla bot yeah Gen 3 to a certain extent uh definitely the energy products um yeah. then this will have a marginal impact on on the overall yeah. bottom line of Tesla Exactly. So. Yeah, exactly. And 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 you know what? You know what I also hate, uh, Hans, is like people that just pretty much agree one hundred percent of the time with what Tesla or Elon say. Like it, it's like man, like some people just can't get an opinion otherwise. And it's like mm -hmm. if Elon, if and Elon, by the way, has said maybe we should run ads because like our safety is incredible. Mm -hmm. Like maybe we should. The minute he switches, let's say, because Elon's Elon in business, what I've learned from Elon is he pivots like fast right yeah. like this guy yes. likes twitter he's like screw it i'll buy twitter right like he like he pivots fast when he wants to do stuff and so when he pivots the day will come when he pivots and he wants to run ads about safety mm -hmm. i i just i i want to see the just the look on people's faces that agree with that have been so staunchly against advertising and just see what mm -hmm. they will say and how they'll how that all of a sudden it'll be justified my point yeah. to say is let's all be humble and realize that not everyone, no matter even Elon, has all the perfect answers at all times. It's okay to disagree with Elon. Does it? It's not a statement about your IQ versus his. It's just a statement of, of it's just mm -hmm. a disagreement about business. And business is not black and white. Um, and there's a lot of shades of gray. And being able to debate on both sides of the point is 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 very crucial. Um, so, uh, just something I had to get out there. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love that because that is something that it's really easy. Have you read Tim Urban's book, uh, What's Our Problem? No, I chance? haven't. It, it's a very interesting book. Really, I would I would highly, highly recommend the first portion of the book. And then the latter portion is kind of, it depends on you know what you're wanting from the book. The end of the book is essentially just a takedown on what Tim terms social justice fundamentalism which is different than social justice um and that's a, a very valuable critique but the beginning of the book just sets up kind of how we are and the best framework from the book is that we tend to think of a lot of topics politics especially in like a one-dimensional linear spectrum that you've got the left is over here the right is over mm -hmm. here and all things political exist on this spectrum on this line he's like no really there's a two-dimensional aspect to that and so instead of just here are left ideas here are right ideas then there's also low rung and high rung and it kind of mm. um associates to authoritarian versus more libertarian mm -hmm. um but the the low rung thinking is just really i have descended into my primal brain I'm not using my neocortex. I'm not open to engaging at the level of ideas critically. Like these mm. are the ideas that must be right. These are the ideas that must be right. And then those two things just go at a war. And yeah. a lot of what we've seen, especially with social media, is that social media is kind of designed to engage us at the primitive level because that is what gets us to spend more time on their platform and it yeah. drives their advertising budgets. Um, and so that's a lot more what's common these days, whereas what's needed is for people to actually engage in the battle of ideas where you can mm. have a fierce debate about an idea and not necessarily yeah. have that idea ruin the ability of two people to like have yeah. a positive relationship with one another and have mutual respect. And so that's like exactly. high rung political thinking versus low rung political thinking. And, mm. but yeah, I've, I've watched this definitely play out in the, in the Tesla sphere. You've got your Tesla Q stands and then you've got your Tesla stands and it can get yeah. real ugly. And um, you know, it's, I really enjoy the high rung, I think that's what attracts me to the t Tesla community is that, yes, there is that, but there's also like the cream of the crop Tesla community people are all high rung thinkers who can engage in very 
intellectually honest debate and are very curious about all the different perspectives from all the different sides and trying to understand all of it and synthesize something that makes sense and you know reconfigure their positions and their expectations and their perspective based on a broad set of inputs from a broad set of sources exactly yeah yeah i think that nuance is important and people don't <laughs> I, I don't know why it's just, it's frustrating to see that people take stuff personally when at the end of the day, we're trying to debate about the future prospects of a business mm -hmm. and whether or not we believe that they'll be successful or not. Um, yeah, there's a lot of personal taking. And I guess that kind of happens when you have people's money on the line, mm -hmm. both long or short, you kind of have the motions that kick in. But um, but yeah, I'm very excited to see what uh, what happens with this advertising debate because I, I feel like by the end of the year we might get an answer from Elon about it at one of these uh, uh, earnings calls, um, one of these quarters that are left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say just to clarify my position, like I don't know that necessarily today is the day that that needs to begin. I think that it would be in the best long term interest of the mission for Tesla to take that mantle on at some point, and I think sooner is better than later if you're. If you're truly engaging in an educational campaign, there's no reason not to start sooner rather than later. Um, but you know, if if we are going through the um, supply slump, that uh, is it Mayor Thacker that has the chart, or maybe it's JPR 007. I can't remember who who originally put out that chart, but it's basically showing the EV production curve ramping while the ice production curve goes down, oh, yeah. and there's the valley of JP. death in the middle um yeah and so you know you you may not really want to start the education campaign too far in advance of that valley of death just because then you're going to create another price bubble um if you have an yeah. over an oversaturation of demand while supply is still artificially constrained just because we haven't gotten production ramped up to the the levels that it mm. needs to be so you know, I don't know when the right time to initiate that campaign is, but I definitely would love to see it at some point. Agreed. Yeah. So um, we could go a couple of different directions here. I think one of the things that I want to make sure that we touch on, um, since you are very in touch, I was going back and listening to, oh, and so anyone who has not watched Yashu's interview with Farzad from quite a while ago now, probably going on a year. Um, that was an exceptional interview. Uh, both, I think, calls that each of you made turned out to be very spot on. But it's interesting to to dig into the um, the thought processes that you had there. So go do that. But building on that, um, what were the calls? By the way, sorry, <laughs> I forget what I even said. Was it about inflation? Um, maybe. I I'm trying to yeah, remember. some definitely some calls about inflation and where the like you you basically predicted that the Fed was going to hike rates at a very high rate. Now I don't think you had the call on how high they would go, but you said they were going to just jack up interest rates really high or really fast. That the the mm. rate increases were about to start and they were going to be intense. Um, mm. and yeah, it wasn't too long after that, that, that started. And I think very few people at the time understood just the degree to which that was going to affect growth stocks. Um, mm. but it was, yeah, unfortunate, uh, <laughs> yeah. interesting to go back and yeah, look at that and think, man, while we were talking about Tesla stock, at I think at the time it was seven or eight hundred dollars pre-split right. yeah and uh so yeah three hundreds ish and now we're we're sitting down at 170 i think it was mm -hmm. closed yesterday mm -hmm. so um but all so with your ability to think macro i, I wanted to bring up the uh i was looking at the whole chart of tesla recently and just kind of digesting it and I have a theory on what I see, and I wanted to run it by you, see what you think about this. All right. So I shared this on Twitter. 
It says perspective for newer Tesla investors. Tesla follows product cycles, and that's the stock price of Tesla. Major run-ups occur after Tesla breaks Wall Street's financial models with the success of the S and the 3. Follow-ons like X and Y have minimal impact, and the next cycle is likely to start with at least one or more of either uh, Megapack 2XL, FSD, Gen 3. Um, Optimus is another huge catalyst, but I, I think one or more of these others will, will happen before then. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's the main thing. And the idea being that it, not just the success of the product, but the success of the product as evidenced in the earnings of Tesla. And so you'll get a, a huge bump. Like the first run up in 2013 was on the heels of Tesla posting their first profits after the release of the Model S. And that was a huge surprise to the market and basically broke the models. And then we see consolidation, consolidation from there all the way until the 2019, 2020, 2021 run. Um, And that is when we really see large profits starting to flow out of the ramp of the Model 3. And so... You know, if if that is the case, if we have a parabolic, like it's basically consolidation and moving sideways, and then parabolic breakout, price discovery, and then consolidation, parabolic breakout, um, price discovery, and really the fact that, for example, with the S and the X, like the S was the first vehicle in that premium luxury segment that was more accessible than the Roadster. And since we didn't see a whole lot of price appreciation in Tesla, the stock from the X, I am having a hard time not interpreting that in a way that says that that market segment, the entire premium segment across all vehicle makes and models, that success in that segment was almost baked in to like given to Tesla the share price as a foregone conclusion at the release and profitability of the S. And then similarly, you know, the Y has been massively successful, but its impact on the share price of Tesla has been nominal at best as well. Um, In fact, you know, it seems like the more successful the Y becomes, (laughs) the lower Tesla share price goes. And so that you know, middle premium luxury segment is basically assigned to Tesla in 2021. Um, And I think, you know, I don't know how much to assign to the success of the Model 3 and Y at that point versus how much to assign to, I mean, S&P inclusion is kind of a huge driver all by itself that is, somewhat independent of these other factors. So I think it muddies the pattern a little bit, but what, yeah, do you, do you think that that pattern is going to hold true in the future as, you know, we have a lot more institutional ownership of Tesla these days. So the market dynamics change as the company matures. Can we see another five to 10 X parabolic move again, if we just see massive earnings growth on the back of, I mean, if Bradford Ferguson is correct on his expectations for the financial performance of Megapack, and, you know, it it seems pretty obvious that the one, you know, Lathrop Mega Factory and the one in Shanghai are just going to be the beginnings of that product. Um, that could be a huge windfall to earnings. Obviously, FSD, and I'd love to dig into uh, FSD financials here in just a little bit with you as well. But yeah, what is your what is your take on the pattern? And then how do you think the pattern holds or doesn't hold moving forward based on the product pipeline that we know that Tesla has? 
Yeah, I, I think I generally agree with the uh, buildup um, and then, let's say, uh, breakout of Tesla stock. I think one thing that makes it unique, though, is a lot of short selling prior to the breakout. And so whether it's bankruptcy, whether it's Model, uh, model 3 is not going to scale and their line sucks, like there's been a, a large pool of short selling that goes on prior to these mm -hmm. breakouts. So I think it's not just the earnings. I think it's that but also the fact that shorts have to cover when that happens. And so it sounds like we might like, I have to, I'd have to check short interest to see how it's floating right now, but it seems like I'd reckon because of earnings decline that we're seeing in quarter one, there's probably a degree of people thinking, okay, well, if, if that, if that trend holds, this stock should not get the multiple it currently has. And um, the only thing I would disagree on is uh, with your tweet here is the next point where you talk about Cybertruck. And I see your point because you say, well, um, this, that, this doesn't necessarily have to happen and it didn't happen, uh, like you said, with the Model Y. <clears throat> but I think one thing that makes the Cybertruck a little bit different is, and I go back to kind of Tom Brady times, right? When the Hertz deal was announced and Tom Brady's partnership came out and Tesla went parabolic that next month. There's something about this American dream esque story about Tesla that anytime you see like a Tom Brady tie themselves to Tesla, or you see a demand story like Hertz with a hundred thousand uh, cars that wanted to buy, there's just like wall street, like drools over that. And the Cybertruck specifically, I think is a little bit different than the model Y because there is concern from people about, well, how much is the model Y eating into the model three and the cannibalization there? Remember, Tesla groups them together, so it's not like we're just going to mm -hmm. know, you know, uh, in North America or in, or in the United, in, in the USA, how much of cannibalization has actually happened. You know, we can we can get a get a, get a, uh, get it uh, through a proxy way, but at the end of the day, I think what makes a Cybertruck different is that it's a totally new um, model of vehicle. It's a totally new line segment for Tesla, and more importantly to me. It's a totally new segment of investor base or user base for Tesla. Tesla doesn't have that general contractor today that's an electrician, uh, but then also does concrete work and maybe owns a business, uh, maybe owns just a GC business. They don't have that guy today under their user base. That is big, right? The the Ford F-150 Lightning, the reason why their their demand is still as high as it is, despite um, lacking in quality and cost comparatively to what the Cybertruck will be, is because, I mean, first of all, it's such a needed uh, utility. Uh, utility vehicles like the Ford F-150 are so needed, mm -hmm. right? Less so in, your, in Europe. If you're listening to this in Europe, you're like, oh, you know, we just don't get the North American thing about uh, pickup trucks. And, and I get it, but it's a very American thing to have a car uh, like uh, the Ford F-150 or the Cybertruck. And so when you take that and you basically take uh, an existing car like the Ford F-150, you put it on steroids and you make it look so different, you kind of have almost like this iPhone moment for 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 the for that segment of people. You know, for, uh, pickup trucks have been more or less the same for a long time. Yes, you can add in widgets mm -hmm. and throw in, uh, uh, throw in more budget um, and buttons into the dash. But what the Cybertruck is planning to do and to be all electric is going to introduce a whole new segment base of, of, of people to Tesla. And I often think like maybe Elon's playing the long game and like trying to appease that sort of crowd by saying what he says in lead up to the Cybertruck launching because he wants it to be a success, right? So maybe he's playing to that side of the spectrum of the political spectrum a little bit more than he would otherwise. But I think that's going to be a big catalyst. Otherwise, I agree. Uh, the mega pack is a big one. Of course, margins coming to, to fruition mm -hmm. there. Not as high as people think, right? Some people were saying 50% and that's going to happen by end of the year. And mm -hmm. Martin said, it, I think Zach said it himself. He's like, long term, we're hoping for 20, right? We're hoping for 20%. Um, uh, and so FSD, yes, my timeline on FSD is a little bit more jaded than I think uh, yours or Far, uh, Farzad specifically <laughs> might be. Um, and maybe that's a function of me not tr having FSD beta. And then robo taxi as well is just a and and Tesla bot as well. I think I just look mm -hmm. at that further out. The Gen three platform um, is exciting. Uh, the the I think Mexico is I got to, I think there was some news yesterday that uh, they're they're on track to start building soon. Um, and so we're looking at end of next year, right? Mm -hmm. For 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 that for timeline. So 
I think there's a lot of things that are far out. I think the Cybertruck is probably the closest. That's why I disagree that I actually do think it will be a meaningful catalyst. I, I think I would agree with you there. I, I, in my mind, it's just a difference in magnitude. I think that Cybertruck will be a catalyst, but I don't think that, you know, it might be 20 to 30% of the catalyst of the type of multiple mm -hmm. uh, expansion that we would see with, yeah, large profits from Mega Pack, just because the TAM, you know, the Mega Pack TAM, really it's based on TAM. The, the mm -hmm. TAM for Gen 3, the TAM for FSD, and the TAM for Mega Pack products and just energy products in general is all much larger than the Cybertruck. Yeah. And I do, I mean, yeah. that is another, you know, go a little bit to go back to the advertising conversation. If you're about to have this product launch, like the amount of publicity, I, I've thought about this. So I, I managed a, a cleaning business for a while. And part of that was we had a carpet cleaning segment to what we did mm. that I like, I could get as much out of marketing spend by just buying a Tesla Cybertruck and using that as our carpet cleaning rig True. and, you know, branding ourselves as the cyber carpet cleaners or, you know, yeah. something <laughs> to that effect, having the That's first uh, utility vehicle of that type in this area, like uh, the brand association that would go along with that, the number of eyeballs, like it would just be incredible. And like, I'm sure that we would have our phone ringing off the hook, having that vehicle. <laughs> and it's going to yeah. be that product for <clears throat> so many people. And so like, Mm -hmm. It can be a driving billboard. It's going to be that for like, you know, people are going to see the Cybertruck for the first time and be like, what the heck is that? And people who've exactly. never thought about buying a Tesla will then hit the Tesla website and start clicking around. Yep. And maybe they, you know, don't decide that the Cybertruck is for them or the wait is too long because they're not going to be able to get one for years. And like, oh, in the meantime, this Model Y looks pretty sweet. Um, so I, mm -hmm. I expect to see big things from that. And I, you know, I can't help but wonder if their hesitancy to engage in any sort of marketing right now at this specific point in time is like, you know, y'all have no idea what is about to happen once we start getting these cyber trucks on the road. Like this is, mm -hmm. you know, we don't really want to start a campaign into one of the most, like the largest organic marketing things that will ever be released for the company. So exactly yeah i've thought about that as well and totally agree yeah so um on so on fsd i would love your take specifically on on this so i'll have to go to a different all right so Oftentimes when I hear people talk about FSD, it, it immediately goes to RoboTaxi. And I completely understand why. Like the, the financials of RoboTaxi break everything. But I don't think that we are going to, because people think about it in terms of the financials, I think they skip over a huge intermediate phase of time. And I think that especially like if I was going to try to make the case to a Gary Black on why he should have some form of value assigned to FSD, if not today, soon, this is the argument that I would make to him. And so this is the model that I created. And the idea here is that my sense of Tesla's FSD strategy on pricing is that for a long time, it was specifically designed to keep people out of FSD beta. The pricing was $8,000 and then $10,000 and then $12,000 and then $15,000 because there were more people that were interested in being beta testers than Tesla wanted in the beta testing program for both performance reasons, like the performance really just wasn't where it needed to be, uh, but specifically for safety reasons, that they wanted to be able to filter down to the best of the best beta testers to collect the highest quality data that they would need. And as long as they had the data that they needed, 
to advance the progress of the software, that was all that they wanted. And so they played with the pricing knob in order to compress the beta testing group to what they needed. Mm -hmm. If that is true, there will come a point when safety finally reaches, you know, if robo taxis are going to be a thing, safety has to just be off the charts incredible in terms of performance. Mm -hmm. Um, And on the way to that, there should come a point where, and we've, you know, I think we've gotten a lot closer to this point now with FSD wide release that Tesla feels very confident that people can get in, they can drive a Tesla, they can request the beta and they can operate and they're likely not going to get into a crash that the system The combination of the system plus the driver is safer than anything else, even when the driver is not super attentive or maybe not the best at interacting with FSD beta on the roads. But they are not to the point yet, in my mind, that they are willing to actually actively give this away as a free trial to someone who has not paid for it. You know, having that hurdle of you either have to buy the Mm. subscription or you have to pay full upfront price. Like they're comfortable with the safety at one level, but as far as price elasticity of demand, they're not ready to give that service away for free to someone else. And like the number of beta users would just explode if it was available as a free trial. And so I think that that's kind of how I'm thinking about this right now, that that signal of Tesla giving away FSD beta, if they ever do, as a free trial for anyone that you can have one month of FSD subscription for absolutely free. Anyone in North America can have it just because that's where it works right now. Mm-hmm. That that will signal to me a shift in Tesla's pricing strategy, specifically as it relates to um, to safety. Hmm. That instead of using price as the filter to keep people out of beta, then they can try and maximize profits. So I think that a lot of people are anchored on, well, you know, FSD is too expensive. People aren't going to want to buy it. FSD is even like the functionality is not worth $200 a month. Well, those prices, like we've said, if they're specifically designed to keep people out of beta because they don't want to be overly exposed to safety concerns, but then they get their safety where they need it to be, then the motivation flips to, let's, instead of keeping people out of beta, let's get as many people into FSD beta as humanly possible so that we can reduce the overall miles of ICE usage. Um, So that, you know, allows them to turn up the dial on mission impact as long as they're not having it counteracted by safety risks. And so Mm -hmm. if they pursue a different strategy, it would not surprise me to see tiered pricing for tiered levels of functionality. Mm -hmm. Um, So I set up a poll and I asked people three different questions. So I said, if you owned a Tesla, let's see. See if I can make this a little bit bigger so that you can read it. I can read it, yeah. But uh, yeah, feel free. Yeah. There we go. If you owned a Tesla, what is the most you'd be willing to pay for an FSC subscription that required you to pay attention at all times? But it was so good that you only needed to intervene less than five times per month. So that's you know a significant advance in functionality, even from today, even with 11.4. Um <clears throat> The response to that was 59 people said the most they would pay is $25, 67 said $50 a month, 102 said $100 a month, and 35 said they would pay, um, I think that was basically C results. And so I think I ended up um, excluding these people from the from the total. Um, and so I took that and I, I created a weighted average that said people on average are willing to pay $67.90 for that level of functionality. And then I just annualized that. Uh, and then I did the same thing for essentially a level three. So that was a level two poll. You know, if I, I would call that 
what most people call level two autonomy. Um, level three, if you owned a Tesla, what is the most you'd be willing to pay for an FST subscription per month that required you to sit in the driver's seat, but you did not have to pay attention unless the car told you that you had to pay attention? Um, mm -hmm. So the weighted average on that went from $65.90 to $156.33. And then the level four poll, if you owned a Tesla, what is the most you'd be willing to pay for an FSD subscription for purely personal use? So no commercial use whatsoever, no robo taxis, no regulatory approval for robo taxis um, that could drive to pick you up or your loved ones without anyone in the car. So it could operate completely autonomously, but it was not something that you could use as a business in any sort of way. Um, the weighted average on that poll ended up being $291.12. And so this is complete speculation on my part, but it makes sense to me that Tesla would offer tiered levels of pricing for tiered levels of functionality once you know once fsd is capable of level four once they're capable of level three and once they're capable of level two all combined that they'll allow a user to buy in at whatever price point they see as being valuable um and since this is a very conservative model aimed at someone like a gary black what I did was I just plotted the um, installed base all the way out to 2030, assuming that we deliver roughly 10 million vehicles in 2030. Um, and so the installed base in 2030, assuming a CAGR, so assuming 2 million deliveries in 2023, and then a CAGR that kind of declines from 35% down to 20% in order to hit that 10 million units in 2030 number we would end up with an installed base of roughly 46 million cars in 2030 that are FSD capable. Um, if we say that they're trying to maximize FSD subscription, but there's gonna be other uses for Tesla that not everyone is going to be opted in. I don't know really how to put this, but I just assumed a 55% FSD subscription take rate at that point in time. And um, I averaged, so I said basically one third of people would take the level two price, one third of people would take the level three price, one third of people would take the level four price. Um, that's what that two thousand dollars is. Okay. That's ARR, yeah. and so you can see the annualized for level four is about thirty five hundred dollars a year annualized on level three is about $2,000 a year and annualized on level two was about $800 a year. And so I just said the average FSD ARR, um, it will increase as they release functionality. So basically they'll hit level two sometime in 2024. They'll hit the ability to do level three sometime in 2025. They'll hit the ability to offer level four in 2026. And that's where it'll just be one third, one third, one third in the assumptions of the model. Doing all that, you end up with over $50 billion in FSD ARR. So this is mm -hmm. completely, this is an intermediate scenario. There's no robo taxi involved whatsoever. This is just software as a service revenue that Tesla can charge based on personal use of Tesla vehicles um, and I mean, maybe the 55% take rate is a little bit optimistic, but I would assume that they're able to do some sort of fleet services that would make this fairly reasonable. Um, and then I just assigned a 30 multiple in 2030. I, I do discount it twice, but like I put in a 20% hurdle rate and I say that, you know, this whole scenario is about 60% likely doing all that, I discount it back to today and say that should be an incremental value of about $67.50. And all this stuff, you can you know put numbers in and change it. So this is something I've talked about a little bit on Farzad's channel, um, but I've never heard anyone else really putting any pen to paper on this intermediate 
step of FSD value. Um, and I'm curious to see how does that, you know, I, you said earlier that you're a little bit less bullish on FSD progress than maybe Farzad and I would be, but what's your, what's your gut reaction to this scenario and kind of this model overall? Yeah. Uh, awesome analysis. Awesome model. Um, I actually have a video out. I think one of my first, uh, in the first couple months of me posting videos, it was like, why FSD is worth a thousand dollars today. This is pre splits, right? A thousand dollars today with no robo taxis. And so I've, tr I've done not as methodical as this, but like, okay, if Tesla charged a hundred bucks per month over the course of the fleet, how would that look like? I think the biggest differentiation for someone like you talk about Gary Black or Wall Street, the reason why they don't care about level two and three is because they are a, a, a black or white approach with robo taxis for the sole reason where they think, rightfully or wrongfully, they think, look, if I'm going to have to intervene at any given point, whether it's five times a month or you know, whether it's tomorrow, whether it's today, whether it's like two times on this trip mm -hmm. and no, and no times the next two, like that's not worth anything. Uh, that's not worth anything, um, anything to me. That's just annoying. And so th they're black and white because the way that they look at it is if it's a hundred percent there and it works, I could now monetize it without me having to be there. Even if it needs one or two interventions and those interventions can be at any random point. Well, guess what? I have to be with that car now. So that zero intervention scenario mm -hmm. opens it up to where you can actually monetize this thing fully independently, right? It's like having a kid that can do everything, but just can't drink water by himself. It's like, okay, well, he can he can write books, he can write essays, but anytime he needs water, he might need me. It's like, okay, can I really leave him alone? So it's like this kind of crutch that level two and three can be, mm -hmm. which is why I often talk about, and I agree with this modeling, but I think what you have to throw in here is supercharging credits maybe you have to throw in an extra feature or two that you the, that you only get let's say you know for example on the 110 dollar per month package maybe tesla gives you 200 miles of supercharging within this package maybe they give you auto lane change uh but you don't get um uh, fsd uh, fully you get auto lane change you mm -hmm. get smart summon uh, you don't even get beta on this thing or, or FSD. You don't even get that. But let's call it like a hundred dollar per month package. It's not even FSD, but Tesla can package what they have currently in terms of their software and just sell it. And maybe FSD is only on this level for uh, two hundred and ninety nine dollar per month package that you have, and mm -hmm. only those people ever get to try it. Uh, but everyone else gets to do all the cool features that they might want, um, and they get supercharging mixed in. And I'm very excited about Tesla App Store. Maybe they get App Store credits. Uh, maybe they get the ability mm -hmm. to go ad free on the App Store. Like, you know, there's so much, uh, th th there's a lot with software, I think, that can get baked in. But your point still stands. And that's, that's can Tesla sell something for $100 per month, packaging up just software costs and package that up to the fleet to sell? Whether it's app, uh, whether it's software, whether it's uh, car features, whether it's supercharging credits, whatever it is, can Tesla do that? And I agree with your uh, bottom line, which is that they can at this lower tier price point, excluding FSD. Now, if that's the case, it's just a matter of Tesla figuring out and finagling what is our best package for that. Because you're right, yeah. if Tesla even unlocks a third of cars in the fleet to sell this $100 per month package to, that's like that's essentially free money that no one I think is really... Uh, uh, projecting onto Tesla stock right now. So your point said that it, to be fair, I think this is what Elon is really hinting at when he says like, look, we have a software advantage. If we just add to our fleet, albeit at lower margins and we continue to just keep this ball rolling of increase of increasing our fleet come 2025, 2026, when you have, when we have multiple millions, you know, five plus mm -hmm. million cars in the fleet, man, and we unlock something for 100, 150 bucks per month that doesn't even include FSD, you're going to want as many cars subscribing on that then. Uh, and we know, like, for example, Adobe, right? When Adobe switched everything from like lifetime uh, packages for Microsoft and Excel, uh, now it's like subscription, it's annual. They can recognize the revenue right away. Um, it, it, Wall Street loves SaaS, right? Anything SaaS, Wall Street loves mm -hmm. to project. The, you know, they love the continuity that you might be paying for this until the day you die, right? They love this, right? It's like very sinister of Wall Street, but they love the whole, man, I can't wait till the rebuilds hit. So 
I, I'm super excited about this as well. And it's, it's a really good poll that you made because I think the bottom line is even I look at myself, I don't pay for FSD. Uh, we don't have FSD subscription up in Canada either. So it kind of makes it, uh, I'm kind of stuck. I'm not paying, I think it's $19,500 now Canadian uh, to subscribe for FSD. So I don't have it. But if Tesla came out with something for a hundred bucks per month and it packaged up a bunch of cool features that I do want to try, like personally, um, mm-hmm. I've never tried Smart Summon. That would be something, that, you know, I think pretty cool to get out of my parking stall. If they packaged up auto lane change, which I hear people bragging about all the time, I would pay for that. And so that, uh, I think what you're hinting on there is there's so much unmet demand that exists. And how much would that cost Tesla if they gave me that? If if I'm paying a hundred if I'm paying them a hundred bucks per month, like that costs Tesla what like two dollars of server time? Like I, I don't mm-hmm. even know like to to send to, yeah. uh, to send me that. Well, that's pay. that's why it makes so much sense to give them away as free trial. Like the cost to give you a trial is zero, and then if you yeah. like it, then you're locked in. Like that's it's literally free marketing. Um, and when you're talking about, like you said, it's SaaS revenue that is the high, like it's the best form of revenue possible, then that free marketing makes so much sense. And like, I have a hard time believing that they won't pursue some sort of strategy like that in order to, to maximize their revenues. And you can, like you said, this is exactly the way that Elon is thinking, obviously, because, you the only reason that it makes sense like the comments that i know that a lot of people listen to and got very scared by that we could take margins all the way down to zero if we had to just to get more in theoretically you could even go to negative margins just get more metal out on the roads so that we can increase our installed base because we as a management team are 100 percent confident that we're going to be able to monetize that installed base yeah. with SaaS products in the future um, yep. I think most people don't really like, they heard the scary parts of that and they didn't think through the, even non, like uh, the reason that a lot of people discount it is because they immediately think all the way down the road to robo taxi. And that's just not the only mm. way for mm. Tesla to actually make money on these computers on wheels. And so it, I think this is a good time for me because I did this analysis, I don't know, probably back in October or November of last year. I think it's a, mm. a good point in time to just remind myself that this is, or something like this is the strategy of management and all of this stuff makes sense in that yeah. context. But it is tough because it's not like they're, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not like they're explicitly saying this either, right? Like you're having to deduce this and read between the lines. If they were to come out and say, look, we have a software advantage because we don't need RoboTaxi. If we launch something for a hundred bucks per month, you don't think we could get 20% of, of our current fleet to subscribe to this thing? Come on, guys. Like they'd really have to mm-hmm. shake this until, because like otherwise we're, to be fair, we are going out on a limb to say that this is even something that's on their radar. Like it probably is because it makes a lot of logical sense. Mm-hmm. But unless we hear it from them to say, screw FSD for a second, guys, if we just launched the software package uh, with an app, like maybe they do an app store, but they only give you the app store if you subscribe monthly, right? That's, mm-hmm. That could be a very good way that they do this, right? Like it, it, Apple's model is everyone gets an app store, everyone gets free apps. Maybe Tesla does it where it's like, look, we're only giving you the app store if you subscribe to this package because this package gives you internet it gives you supercharging credits. It gives you this, and it gives you the ability to install apps on your car. Like I was talking about, why isn't there not a uh, why is there not a YouTube streaming um, function out of my cabin mm-hmm. camera that I can stream in the car when it's parked? You know, little stuff like that. That I think mm-hmm. if, this is software, right? I love I love the business of software because the marginal costs are not very high. And I agree, there's a lot Tesla can do. We are going out on a limb on saying this because it's not like we've heard Zach or, or Elon or Drew or anyone talk about this sort of stuff other than just saying the black box word of software, but it totally makes sense. Yeah. So I know you've got to head out here shortly and I would kick myself if I didn't ask you, you have one of the best communities in the whole Tesla sphere in the Juju gang. That's awesome. I know that, that is not by accident and so i want to ask you like how do you think about building your community what are some strategies that you've 
used in order to accomplish that. And um, specifically, how does the concept of the thousand true fans sit in what all you're doing? Um, like, is that the centerpiece of kind of how you started thinking about all of this and everything branches off of that? Or is it a little bit mm -hmm. peripheral and... Um, maybe explain what the thousand true fans concept is to, to listeners who have never encountered that before. Yeah. So I actually have read that essay. It's like, I think Kevin Kelly, he wrote thousand true fans. And it's basically like, if, if you want to accomplish anything in terms of a community, all you need is a thousand true fans to be able to, to get your message and amplify it. And from there it'll organically grow. It's just getting to the, to the first thousand. Um, and first of all, I really appreciate the kind words. I, I have to say, like, our community is awesome, not because of me. It's it's awesome uh, it, despite me, right? Like, it's in spite of what I am, it is awesome. And I think it really comes from the fact that a lot of the content that I try to do, at least really concertedly, tries to be positive, right? Not not um um not pollyannishly right not in a way that is blind to the realities but it's positive in a way where it's like if we're wrong we're happy to be wrong and we want to get better if we want to debate we're not debating people uh and, and and their personalities we're debating their ideas that they have and at least i think when i've tried to make the channel and and i think one of the differentiations for my channel at least early on was that i was the only one live streaming about tesla content for a while and when you live stream you get to have this back and forth engagement with uh, with your community that you don't get if you pre-record a video. So when I started doing a lot of like S&P inclusion was my, my first big live stream, right? Uh, S&P inclusion was happening. Um, I was, had my whole setup here. People were like, yeah, she got a live stream for this thing. I set everything up. It was my first big live stream. Um, in fact, I think it was my first actual live stream. And so setting all that up, I was able to like talk to people like we're all sitting at a bar or a restaurant and just like, oh, someone comments that I read it out. Then I say my reply. Then someone else. And so this organically almost happened where it's like people just I think people enjoy conversation where they enjoy people just talking at them. And I'm not one to want to talk uh, at people too much and preach or, you know, you know, kind of come at people like I'm right, you're wrong. Uh, mostly because I've been humbled a lot before. <laughs> I could always be more humbled. Um, but it, it's just it's just grew in a way where I think the live streams really helped engaging that uh, engaging the audience into it, making them feel like I get messages sometimes. Um, this early on, I got this message that really like motivated me. Someone's like watching Yash is like sitting down on the couch and just like talking with an old friend. And I was like, wow, that's that's unreal for me to just be sitting here candidly on my computer, not really doing anything. To, to me, it feels like, and that there's people out there that are, whether it's nighttime in Europe or or afternoon in North America, they feel like they're connecting with me. And I have to say, I think the live streams really did, uh, really made the difference for me and my channel and the community that we've built. And I think just fostering that, promoting what's positive, promoting different idea, uh, different ideas, positive or negative, but doing it in, in a light that is not supposed to be negative if that makes sense right if there's something that's bearish that's fine but let's talk about the realities of it but let's not uh, turn it into doom is gloom and vice versa let's not be blind to stuff that we're all bullish on mm. because i think it's always good to to have both sides of the coin um uh, in your back pocket to debate and getting to know the other side so I'm just honored. Um, I, I think the Juju Gang is 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 great. And by the way, if anyone's confused about how the term Juju Gang came out, um, early on in my live streams, I would always be eat, uh, eating like mandarins or oranges, and so, and it just became like a running joke that every time I took uh, a bite of an orange or or uh, I guess a piece of an orange, the like Tesla stock kept rallying. So I was like, keep eating that orange. I'm like, oh man, this orange is like good juju. And so it kind of stuck on with like uh, the juju being orange. And now that's kind of like my, like the, all my branding is like this orange guy smiling. So that's kind of how it happened. It was very random. And, uh, but although I, I will say, Abby, my fiance, she likes to take credit for the juju part because she's like, oh, the orange is good juju. And I kind of set it on stream and kind of made it my own. So I have to give her her, her flowers for that. But uh, but it's it's really the community, and I think being able to um, and some advice, some unsolicited advice to you, Hans, as, as you build your community, is that promote the people that you really think are good people, and talk about them, and read their comments, and the people that aren't, don't even give them any light, because I think the 
oftentimes our insecurities can get to us and we read a bad comment. And I think what I've learned is in one in one year out the other, unless it's constructive criticism, which I'm happy to 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 get better on. If it's truly negative and you know that person is just having a bad day, don't even think about it. Pass that comment. Do whatever you need to do. Move on. The minute you start giving it more light, you're trying to fight back on it. All you're doing is it's like you're burning yourself with fire, right? There's, you're holding a piece of coal is, is the metaphor, right? So there's no point in doing that. Um, that's kind of my motto. Doesn't work all the time. Yes, I let mm -hmm. comments get get to me all the time, but it's just something that you that you get better on as kind of you progress, I guess, in your in your journey. Well, that's a great practical example of just the power of positive reinforcement that, like you said, you're not like, there's no negative reinforcement. You're not even calling out like, Hey, don't be like that. You're solely engaging with positive reinforcement. What are the things that I want to amplify? And that it's really cool to see how that has turned into over time, you know, just doing that only, and then doing that consistently over time has created the community that you have, which, uh, yeah, like it's encouraging. It's hopeful in in a world where it's very easy to get sucked down the negative spiral on any sort of media um to know that that's mm -hmm. a strategy that exists as an alternative um and that it can have amazing results is really cool well thank you very much for spending this time with me today yashu i am honored uh i've really enjoyed the conversation you're welcome to come back anytime and for anyone who is not subscribe to yashu go check out his channel um i'll put links in the description so that you can find him both on twitter and on youtube um is there anything else that you'd like to plug while you're here no i think the honor is mine hans thanks for bringing me on early in your journey and and i wish you the best of success and i know you'll have a uh, tremendous amount of success because what you're doing is something that you enjoy and i think when you get together with people that enjoy what they're doing. Look at us talking on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's not we're not doing it because we're we we want flowers. We want uh, we want fruits from our labor. It's we're doing it just because we enjoy it, the process. Uh, I think only good things can happen. So I wish you the best. Everyone, subscribe to Hans as well, and I appreciate having me on. Uh, really, the honor is mine. Awesome. All right. Well, I hope everyone watching this has a wonderful day, and we will catch you in the next one. Bye. Right on.